Hi, today I'm talking with Chips Howarth of Cyclops Marine, which uh, have built a range of new smart range of load sensors and also the way that you can measure rig tension and, and anything on your boat where you need something in line and it's, it's a really quite an innovative solution. And first of all, in your life in the marine industry, you've been in various companies, Chips. Can you tell me a little bit about what you've been involved in? Uh, yeah, hi, Mark. Yeah, um, uh, well, I, you know, I'm a qualified geologist, which is obviously essential to work in the marine industry. And I initially worked for Shell Oil out of university in Portsmouth. Uh, uh, but then, you know, I was, I was a keen sailor and I got drawn into the industry like so many people. And I was the, the, the I, I blagged the job with uh, Jack Holt uh, and sold uh, the Holt fittings uh, as a sales manager for the UK. Uh, for about five or six years and, and that was a fantastic grounding for me because I, I really learned how to sell I think which is a real um, uh, you know skill in itself uh, it was something I was passionate about and uh, and I really learned to understand about s supplying what in our industry is known as the OEM the manufacturer the boat builder supplying a component into a, a uh, into a boat builder there's a real sort of nuance how you do that and I really learned that at Holt uh, I then transferred that to Selden uh, the, uh, and, and worked for them. I was, I was made a director of Selden. Um, and, and that was fantastic, again, because that was very much about technology and the rigs. And Selden's a great business. You know, they're they're a, a, you know, a fantastic organization. But, um, you know, it, it was, a, it was a, 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 a meeting at Metz in about 2004 where I stumbled across this crazy guy called Andy Fitzgerald. Uh, and he, he, he drew me into a company called Ocean Air, which uh, at the time was, was fairly young and, and identified a, a need to make really the interiors of boats a lot more pleasant. And uh, we were making a range of blinds for boats. And, and, uh, and I joined that journey with Andy uh, and I was there for 15 years uh, up until very recently. And, and that was a wonderful journey because we, you know, we grew the business by, I think, time six or seven from when I joined it. And we set up a US factory and... We had 200 people working for us in our factory in West Sussex, uh, and, and that was a really exciting journey. And, and I have to say, just in terms of business, I, I learned, I was a sales and marketing director of, of Ocean Air, but just in terms of generally running a business, I learned so much from Andy, who, who ran an exceptional, exceptional ship, also a sailor, uh, in a good 14 sailor, um, uh, and, and really that's led me into this role as the, as the CEO of uh, Cyclops Marine, where I am now. And in the dinghy scene, you really need no introduction throughout the GP14s, Enterprises, Fireballs, 470s, and a range of RS classes. So in parallel with what you've done in, in business and in the marine industry, you've been sailing the entire time. Um, for those who aren't familiar with your sailing, do you want to tell them a little bit about it, your achievements in the classes? Uh, maybe just a brief background because it may resonate with others. So, you know, I, I was brought up on the northern ponds uh, where, where club racing and uh, classes like GP14 and Enterprise were, were huge. Uh, and, uh, uh, and I was inspired in, into sailing uh, through my father and, and, and brother, actually. Um, but then I, did, I got drawn into the, the, the National Youth Squad underneath Jim Saltonstall. And, uh, and, and, and that was really an eye opener to what was happening. Uh, you know, south of the Watford Gap, uh, and and I learned, yeah, and, and that was that was fantastic for, for me, really. Uh, and um, I progressed. It drew me down to the south coast to university, um, and uh, yeah, I, I then was lucky enough to crew for some. You know, I was I was very much a crew for many years, and I, I crewed for some great sailors. But you know, particularly, uh, you know, God rest his soul, Richard Esto, who's no longer with us. I did about six seasons with him in Enterprises, and. We did a few Merlin Rocket Championships, and it just gave me such a grounding in really high-level sailing. Uh, and, um, uh, and and then I, I, I slowly uh, slipped into steering and, and you know sailed like most RS classes, laser, four thousand, five thousand, and, uh, and and then um, uh, five hundred five. You know, I, I hate to think how many classes I might have sailed at some point, uh, but I think what was a real sort of uh, thing for me, and it was probably the groundings of the youth squad. I I just knew I wanted to try an Olympic boat. So I, I raced a 470 for two years leading into the Sydney Olympics, which was a great experience. Uh, but, you know, I wasn't good enough. I didn't win the trials. Um, 
you know, 20 years later, therapy's helping me through that. Uh, and, um, uh, but then what I did do, because I was at Seldon, that there's real value in, in racing lots of other classes where, you know, just being seen towards the front of the fleet with a Seldon rig and talking to people and, 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 and always improving the product. So it was really valuable. Uh, so that's when I was racing RS 800s and, and, and then, and then I kind of fell into the fireball then uh, at that point. And, um, and I think because of my, the, the, the hours I put into the 470, stumbling into the back of a fireball was like falling into an armchair really. I was just so used to steering a, a single trapeze boat and, and the, the, the regret. And, and also, I guess, look at the fireball, you know, it was a blend of my history. There's a lot, there's quite a strong Northern fleet. So there's a, my old mates from up North and, uh, but um, the, the, I also feel like it's a bit of a, a graveyard for, you know, ex-Olympic sailors who never quite made it. So I, I fitted that bracket as well, really nicely. And you got to go and sail abroad against some great guys in some, you know, I don't know, world championship in Kenya, in Barbados. Uh, in Western Australia and in the, the Fremantle Doctor and you know it just gave me such a chance to do that so I think in recent years I've very much been a fireball guy but yeah I did do a lot of yacht racing as well I raced uh, J24s a lot I guess I think your dad and uh, yeah. uh, an uncle and um, uh, Mel just 24 so with, uh, with John Merricks so for a, a few seasons in those and also ultra 30s with Laurie Smith so I did push a bit of lead around uh, as well, uh, but never steering. Uh, so I, I, I do sort of have a bit of a yacht understanding. I always kept coming back to dinghies because I just, for me, just the dynamic connection your body has with the speed of the boat. You know, there's always so much fun hanging on a guardrail you can have, whereas in a dinghy where your body weight is the driving energy, I think that for me is a real passion in sailing. So a sailing experience that is seriously diverse um, but moving on to Cyclops Marine your new company um, how did the idea come about for this? Well the business is a few years old now and, and the, the background to the business was some um, sort of vision that was coming a little bit out of America's Cup but uh, it was really to hybrid load sensing so, so being able to, to sense the load in any either a piece of wire or a piece of rope but then communicate it as effectively and efficiently as possible. And that was Bluetooth technology. And what we did is we, 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 we sort of got into the technology center of Cambridge University and got them to help us. So one of the founders of the business is, is a great, is, is Dr. Uh, Ed Colby, who's one of the world's leading experts in strain gauging, which is the posh word for uh, load sensing and, and, um, uh, and Bluetooth technology, which allowed us to make very small devices without needing bits of wire. So suddenly you can have devices that can just sort of in, in, in simple language that kind of clip onto your boat bits and immediately tell you what the loads are. Now, why I think that is essential is, is, is uh, and, and what we really saw in the, in the marine industry was um, uh, there's been a plethora of, of, of great technology going on in the electronics world. Now, so I'm looking at the yacht market right now. When you go yacht racing, the, 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 the technology you can see from the likes of B&G, Raymarine, Garmin, is, is, uh, is outstanding. And, and the sophistication of the, you know, your, your, the wind speed, the hull speed, the GPS tracking is, uh, is, and I think what you've got is some big companies really you know, fighting it out there. So the technology has really moved on. But when you go sailing, your rig load, which is really a key kind of, accelerator pedal for how quick you're going to go is still being done in a seat of the pants way you know people waggling shrouds still or using a bent bit of metal uh, to, to gauge to guess the rig tension and, and and outside of top end america's cup you know and i'm talking about the boats that are racing around in the solent or whether it's in the bay of annapolis or sydney harbour that's sort of how we're still setting our rigs up you know there's a few pros at the front of the fleet who are doing it by eye but for mere mortals like the rest of us we, we're sort of guessing our way and I think we just saw that there was a, a place in the market to bring real analytical data to that rig loading. So then you can start giving you know, sailors to say, well, if you set it to this number and we're doing this in a, in, in a load number, a, a tonnage or a kilo weight, you know, in this wind condition, you will be on that. You know, that, we've all felt that feeling of being in the groove. I, mean, I just think it's such a wonderful phrase in sailing. I came out of the start line, I was in the groove. Well, what does that mean? It probably means you just had your boat set up really well for that condition. And my God, that's a nice feeling. And, and hopefully we've got devices that are going to allow people to get to that position analytically and, and more readily, as opposed to those days where you go, I don't know what I'm doing wrong, but God, it feels slow. 
and, uh, and, and hopefully we're going to help people get through that journey a little easier. We've all had that time. We've got our markings on the jib sheets, the main sheets, the track positions. We've got them all written down. But if our rig is set up differently with a different tension on, then those settings are going to be meaningless without actually knowing what the rig tension is. Well, well absolutely, because you think uh, you know, rig tension does so, so much, uh, um, but there's, I, I think I kind of see this in two ways as well. One of them is getting that static setting right. So when you're on the dock, you know that your rig sends settings, you know, you're winding your bottle screws up, you're going through your, this is my light setting and medium. You kind of know your numbers by how many turns you're doing. Uh, I, I think that's that's one thing, uh, and and you and you go say and that that's really to do with as, as you know, Mark, it's to do with the the, the, the force they sag. So that's really defining that the the depth of your foresail. Also, that's a compression in the mast. You know, so I've got my Selden hat on again now. How much that mast is bending, which is influencing your mainsail shape. So that rig load is really dictating the shape of both your upwind sails. Uh, and um, and but there's one thing to kind of know it on the dock, and our, and the kind of crude devices we're using these days roughly give you that, but honestly quite inaccurately as well. But as soon as you go on the water and you start inducing the more dynamic controls like main sheets and backstay load, and you stick a bit of weight on the rail, that then then that all becomes meaningless. You need to know the load, the dynamic load as you're racing, and uh, and that's the really critical one. And that's what we identified we had to be able to do. And, and the great thing is we can feed all of that data into the existing great electronic technology. So you can be going at wind, looking at your instruments and your full stay load is there. And it's changing as you adjust things. So you, you go in the wind, you see that gust and you can pull your back stay on and you can see the number change. Well, we're up at 1.2 tons and you hit that groove, which is all what we're all trying to do. And the technology itself, as you say, a few years ago, Yes, this was on America's Cup yachts, super yachts, but this is now accessible for mainstream racing. Absolutely. So if I can just show you one of the devices, I mean, this tiny little thing here is, is effective for the bottle screw body and the sort of um, uh, bottle screw you would have on, uh, on any boat with uh, any boat in the sort of 20 to 25 foot uh, uh, size range. So you just take your dumb bottle screw off and if let's say we put this on the forestay of the shroud and just wind this on and it's a beautiful, you know, you can, it's a nice sort of tactile feel to wind it on. But the real alchemy of the product is going on inside here where in line, we are we are strain gauging, we are loads, we are sensing the load going through this bit of metal. We're then converting it to a language that can be interpreted. And by Bluetooth, we communicate, there's no wires that were by Bluetooth, we're then communicating this, and it can either go to your phone app, so straight away you can put this on your, your force day, and straight away on your phone you'll know exactly what your rig loads are. Uh, but also with, with, a, with a little bit of plumbing, uh, with one of our gateways, you can plug it into your uh, boat electronic system and see it on your uh, instruments and and, the, and you know the, the people using our products right now that's generally what they're doing and, it, and it's great to see you know j111s and this little this plethora of the new short-handed single single-handed boats just seeing them up on that display you know, that number is, is fantastic to see so and this is white. something this is something that is very easy to retrofit onto your boat you literally just take off the old bottle screw that you had and put on yeah. this device just and yeah. it's actually yeah. much, much easier to turn than what you'd have with an old bottle screw where you're jamming a screwdriver into it. Well, definitely with this sports boat one, we wanted to do that. So the idea being you might grip the top of that, you might grip the wire with a pair of pliers or a pair of, a pair of um, a spanner, but then you can do this by hand. So, and, and, and we designed that on purpose. The bigger ones, once you get up to the bigger load, so this is probably something for a 40 footer, you know, we've designed this either to, to be able to spanner it, but it uh, or, or you can put a, a, a a bar inside to turn it so as you get bigger you know the units do get bigger but it's, it's exactly the same technology going on you know it's wireless you just change a dumb bottle screw and put a smart one on and then straight away you're getting live real-time rig loads and how about battery life on these devices um I, with bluetooth communication you're going to need to charge it up how is that done well, we're using low energy Bluetooth. Uh, so on these larger devices, you're just using the normal AA batteries you can buy anywhere and that will last you six months. We've designed this, so it's, it's communicating uh, at one hertz so every single second it is telling you your rig load and, and that, that rate. 
this one was 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 a challenge for us. And again, it's the technology out of Cambridge, out of out of uh, Dr. Ed, who, who's just developed this so well. We've had to to keep the size of this down. We've just gone with a small the two O three two button batteries, um, which which will have a, a much shorter life. So what we've done is put a smart um, a smart button on this. So depending on how many, it's sort of an intuitive series of settings. So you can kind of set it for the day. So you say, right, we're going to go racing today, set it to great hours. So when you get ashore, it will just automatically turn itself off as you, as you hit the dock. Uh, and as a result, you should get around about 30 or 40 days racing out of one of these devices, which, and then all you have to do is go down the supermarket and buy yourself a little button battery and, and you get another 40 day sale. So the 2032s, I've got these things that I've got oh, basically just sitting around. And one of those will power the thing for 20 hours? 200 hours. 200 hours, okay. 200, yeah. 200 hours. Uh, so, yeah, if you, and you can adjust the uh, intelligent settings. So, so we reckon it'll be about 30 to 40 days of racing. You'll probably get out of your one battery. Which so seriously which, easy solution hmm. and not something where you have to worry about taking it off to charge it. You just literally just change the battery for something which is straight off the shelf. Absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Brilliant. And you must be working with sailors to get the feedback, working out what works, what doesn't work and um, how the solution works in the real world. Um, who, who have been your test bed really for these products? We've probably got, I'd probably break that down into two. And then the first one, and I'm going to show you another product is with, um, uh, we, we actually did a development project with uh, um, INEOS Team UK and, and Sir Ben Ainsley's team, where we, we realized what we also needed to, to do was sense loads going through ropes. So if I just show you that this is a, a, a product we designed for, for uh, INEOS, uh, we developed it with them. And the idea being, you know, you can tie ropes onto these. So say for, in, in the normal world, for things like backstays, vans, kite sheets, uh, bob stays, uh, you know, the tacks of code zeros. Uh, and these are titanium pieces. And we're just sensing the load across this tiny distance here. Yeah, we've still got an accuracy well inside 1% accuracy of the load. Uh, and so the relevance of that is, I think, what the America's Cup challenge, uh, and it's interesting, they called America's Cup challenges, they really challenged us and they said, you have got to make the smallest load sensors and the lightest in the world. And when you've done that, you're going to make them smaller and lighter again. And, and, and it was a great challenge for us to do that. And, uh, and I think as a result, it means you've now got a really lovely range of these small sort of rope sensors. So, so you know, the way I view it, we can do wire and we can do rope. Uh, but, but it was very much working with Ben's team that really challenged us. Uh, you know, if you, if you saw the original designs and where we are now, it's been a great experience for us uh, to, um, to have that America's Cup challenge put on us. But in terms of now, now we're in the, now we're in the sort of real world of, of, of sailing with them, uh, I think what we're seeing is, uh, <laughs> being honest right now, we're probably in the environment, we've only been uh, commercially delivering these since the new year. So we're, we're only six months into it, three of which have lost to, to the coronavirus. So very much our, our current users are real first movers. People who get the technology and realize what it's all about. So we've got, we've got um, some of these shorthanded Olympic guys, Henry Bomby, one of the British guys. Uh, you know, he's an absolute advocate of, of it because he's realizing the, the value of capturing this data and, 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 and seeing it. And I think up to now, you know, I talked about the value you can get on the dock, getting your base settings right, the value of seeing it live when you're racing. But the, the real benefits of these you know, Olympic guys is to then be able to download that data and pump it into some analysis software. So, because what happens then is, is our data, so you'll get a log of what your rig loads were through the day, but what that then does is hybrid with things like wind speed, heel angle, uh, boat, boat speed, um, uh, and all the other things that are pumping into the, uh, into the sort of the central processor. And then there's, there's amazing pieces of uh, software now that are, is, is probably the, you know, the, the, the really new technology coming into our industry. People like KND, SailNord, and you pump this data and it immediately gives you a sort of a, a post-race analysis. It's, it's kind of like the, you know, the debrief that we used to get from Jim Salton's store. You, you get it electronically now and, uh, and I, I, it takes my breath away the level of information you can get so quickly from these guys. And it just tells you straight away what was fast and what clearly wasn't. And, if that, and, and I see that as being an ultimate way to then re-get the benefits from the, from the dynamic while you're racing because you get this post-analysis 
that really tells you when you're at your fastest. And working with Ben Ainsley with INEOS Team UK, yes, they're saying we want it smaller, we want it lighter, and we want it now, no doubt. But they must be demanding accuracy down to the nth degree, and these devices must be providing that. Yeah, and we also saw, you know, one of the Achilles heels of I think the way people generally measuring rig loads right now. And I remember this from the, you know, the, the Olympic dinghy parks that, you know, that everybody's rig tension was giving them a different number. You kind of just fell in love with your own one, but it was sort of irrelevant because it would be different to somebody else's. So trying to get valuable guidance from say a sail maker. If you buy a new jib from North Sales or One Sales and they'll give you some recommended settings. Well, that's only any good if, if your, your rig gauge is, is, has got any sort of alignment with that. So we knew that was a really important thing. So the, our, um, our rig loads, our, our gauges, we, we're ensuring they're accurate within 1%. But you know, I'm like, it's like going back to a physics class taking on this job. It's been great fun. What I didn't fully appreciate is how much uh, metallurgy changes with temperature. So we're saying it's accurate within 1% from a range of about minus 10 to plus 50. Actually, we're most of the time racing around in between 10 to 20 degrees. Well, maybe in this country, the Bloody Mary, maybe zero to 20 degrees. Now, in that sort of band, we're, we're trying to be accurate within about 0.1% of uh, loads it means on, on on a ton you know we could be getting accurate within almost a kilo so <clears throat> i remember with the traditional lose gauges on the j24 um, when you change one after a few years um, because it's just becoming worn and it would be making one reading and you put on the new one and it would be a completely different reading and you'd have to redo all of your settings and just how annoying that was and so with this over time, does it continue to read the same figures? Uh, yes, it does. And I think, uh, again, one, one thing strain gauging, which is the science behind this really likes, is what's called inline measuring. It loves measuring when it's being stretched. And when you look at the, the, the origins of, of load sensing in, in the marine world has been the has been the, the top race sports, America's Cup and, uh, and Volvo. They tend to use load pins, which is a shear measuring. Now, the downside to that is much more inaccurate and it requires a hell of a lot more calibration. What you really want to check, and so as a result, you know, traditional load sensing in boats has, has needed quite an investment of expertise and time and money making them work that they did to solve that is is do inline strain gauging so that's what we ended up solving so in theory in 10 years time this should be reading exactly the same uh, loads as it was on the first day which are calibrated on our factory at every single one we test and we test it through the temperature range as well every single device this of course provides really game-changing results from a performance point of view but when you look at yachts, there are the vast majority are cruising and there will be charter fleets around the place where the, the charter owners want to know that their yacht is being used safely and within tolerances. And surely this must provide a lot of solutions for fleets such as charter fleets and in, in the cruising yacht market. Yeah, absolutely, Namar. Good question. And we're in, so at the moment, we're kind of running t two projects. Uh, you know, the sexy one is to talk about sailing and being in the racing, sorry, and being in the groove and, and helping you get there. But absolutely, that uh, we are working in a partnership with Lagoon Catamarans down in Bordeaux, part of the Beneteau Group. Uh, that we are uh, going to be load sensing their cats to try and build a warning system to say, hey, you're on your charter, the, the message will be, you're on your charter holiday, this boat's now getting a bit loaded, just take some sails down, just slow things down a little bit. And, and the best way of doing that is to be sensing the load that's going through the boat's rigging to be able to do that. And so we're doing a, a great project uh, with, with them to do that. And, and we see We've got, um, you know, we've got, a, we've got a number of products right now, but we see in the next uh, uh, three years bringing out about another 30 products, and, and a number of those will be much more in the safety side of, uh, of sailing, not just the performance side. And also, with all of this data being recorded, if someone who's chartering a yacht basically ignores the safety warnings, it's it's all logged. 
Oh, exactly. Everybody knows that there's a historic log. Yeah, going back 10 years, I think we capture. So uh, uh, yeah, there's no, there's no hiding from it. Yeah. yeah. Well, Chips, this is a fantastic product to see. And it's, it really is providing a solution that wasn't available, especially when you're talking about the 20 to 30 foot uh, market. So all the best as the business develops. Um, an interesting time, of course, with, with business, but it's these innovative companies that I think will thrive as we come out of the COVID situation. So it's great to see this kind of innovation happening in the marine industry. Many thanks indeed for your time. Thanks a lot, Mark. Thanks. Take care.